afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, taking part in this webinar on acute kidney injury. And in this first talk of the session, um, I will um, try and cover some aspects of uh, the epidemiology of AKI, but also discuss some specific areas of AKI, maybe from a slightly more clinical uh, perspective. So as we all know, AKI is a, a syndrome characterized by a sudden reduction in kidney function. It's defined according to internationally accepted criteria as shown here on, on this slide. And the KDIGO criteria that we now all ascribe to uh, describe three different stages of AKI in increasing severity based on the magnitude of change in an individual's serum creatinine from their baseline or, or their usual uh, serum creatinine value, or uh, maybe less commonly in clinical practice, uh, the degree of oligu oliguria that they're experiencing. Patients with complete kidney failure sometimes need uh, temporary kidney replacement therapy or dialysis, and these patients are within AKI stage three. But this group, uh, although small in number, has specific of care requirements and unfortunately often have the worst uh, prognosis. I think very importantly to say at the outset, AKI is not uh, a specialist topic. The vast majority of cases are seen and managed across all medical and surgical specialties. And the headline messages surrounding AKI really sort of underlie, it, it sort of highlight it, its clinical need in the fact that it's very common uh, in patients who are hospitalized. Um, and it's associated with extremely uh, poor outcomes and particularly uh, high uh, mortality rates. AKI often uh, presents alongside other acute illnesses or following complex surgery, but its lack of uh, clinical signs or symptoms in part explain why uh, we often see variation in the quality of um, AKI care. And these variations in, in the quality of care uh, sometimes contribute to, to the poor patient outcomes. But how common is, is common? Well, even conservative estimates put the global burden of, of AKI at greater than 3 million patients affected by AKI every year um, across the globe. The map shown here uh, shows the, the percentage of hospitalized patients affected by AKI across different uh, regions of the world. And clearly in, in, in some areas, if, if we sort of look at the, the north and west of Africa, these low numbers likely reflect um, issues around testing and access to healthcare. So that, that there may be some reliability um, uh, questions around some of the figures. But that apart, across both low, middle and high income countries, uh, you can see the rates of AKI in hospitalized patients are uh, consistently very high, at least 10 to 20 percent of hospital admissions. And one fairly remarkable thing about the AKI diagnostic criteria is how they retain their associations with poor outcomes, in particular with mortality across a very wide range of healthcare settings. Beyond that, however, as you'd probably expect, there are very different characteristics when you look at um, acute kidney injury in high versus lower uh, income countries as uh, summarized on this slide. So as we are probably more familiar with, AKI in high income countries often occurs in the setting of acute illness or, or, or following surgery, often in um, older patients, often whom uh, many of whom have uh, long-term uh, conditions that increase their, their risk of AKI. Conversely, in lower income countries, AKI is often seen in uh, younger age groups and is often related to communicate, communicable diseases. So infectious causes, poisoning and obstetric complications are a much greater uh, cause of AKI in, in that setting. And what's happened to the epidemiology of AKI over time? And I think there are sort of two themes. I think the first is that um, increased incidence of AKI, um, and that's complicated to, to look at because changes in diagnostic 
criteria that have expanded um, the, uh, the number of patients who we now classify as having AKI, plus increased awareness and, and testing has an effect on that. But this slide shows what's happened to the inc incidence of dialysis requiring AKI um, over the last um, 30 or 40 years. And possibly this is a metric that's less affected by uh, changes in the AKI definition, although clearly not immune from uh, changes in, in practice around sort of initiation of dialysis. However, maybe a slightly more robust number. And you can see as you run down that right hand column, there's been a, a sustained and significant and very a consistently reported increase in AKI um, over uh, the last few decades. At the same time, there's been a trend towards an actual improvement in mortality. And, and again, this might be affected by a change in the denominator as we widen the scope in terms of the patients that we, we define as having AKI. But over, over time, and again, fairly consistent report, um, a, a fall in mortality. But I think maybe the most important thing to note from this graph that even with that fall, mortality rates still remain uh, exceptionally high. So above 20% in uh, hospitalized patients with AKI as compared to the two or 3% in, uh, that, you'd expect, that you'd see across non-elective admissions. It's also widely accepted that AKI is associated with hugely increased healthcare costs, and these have been calculated in a variety of different ways and demonstrated across a number of different healthcare systems. And here are just some examples from the UK, Canada, and, and the US that, that sort of estimate these hugely um, increased healthcare costs associated with AKI. And some of that comes from longer, more complicated um, uh, acute admissions, um, but quite a lot of it comes from the, the long-term uh, consequences of AKI and the impact that AKI has on longer-term uh, health. So within the, the, the spectrum of AKI, it's also possible to delineate, delineate differences between uh, the various clinical settings in, in, in which AKI occurs. And this heterogeneity of the syndrome, I think, is something that we'll, we'll keep returning to through, throughout this webinar. So on this slide, there's some common scenarios here where AKI uh, is, is seen, so cardiac surgery, um, following chemotherapy, sepsis in the ICU, and probably the biggest case uh, load in terms of patient numbers, acute medical admissions or um, medical patients in the emergency room. And the table at the bottom just illustrates both the, the range of um, incidence, uh, a requirement for, for kidney replacement therapy, but also the different outcomes. And uh, uh, it's not that surprising, but very, very striking that um, AKI associated with sepsis has particularly uh, bad outcomes. So traditionally, we've been taught to sort of approach the, this heterogeneity of AKI by determining uh, the cause uh, from a clinical basis. And as summarized on this slide, we've been taught how to think about pre and, and post renal factors versus those intrinsic um, uh, renal diseases. As again, as, 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 as is fairly common knowledge, the vast majority of AKI cases fall in that left-hand column and around about 80% of AKI are due to one or more of these pre-renal factors. But I think it's really important to critique this approach and recognize that there are some very big caveats with, with this approach. Most importantly, that these pre-renal causes that tend to be sort of lumped together are clearly not the same and multiple insults can coexist. And so it's not always a, a clear cut um, a decision as to, as to the, the, the cause of AKI. And just to illustrate that, there are some specific cir circumstances in which AKI does behave really quite differently. And, and, and these are important to highlight. And the first of that is AKI in, in heart failure. Again, as a, at a population level, the combination of AKI and decompensated heart failure often is still associated with worse outcomes, but that's actually not the most important aspect. 
The characteristics of AKI and heart failure are very different. So you very rarely see um, acute tubular necrosis, biomarkers of kidney damage don't associate in the, in the normal ways. And the most important driver of outcome is actually response to, to, to diuretic. So AKI occurs that occurs in the setting of treating decompensated heart failure no longer holds the same associations with poor outcomes if the patient is responding to diuretic. So treating the heart failure and decongesting the patient is actually uh, the key driver of, of outcome in, in, this, in this situation. And that's important to recognize to make sure that the AKI isn't in, misinterpreted in that scenario. I think contrast associated AKI is also an area that, that still causes a lot of clinical concern and, and questions. But again, I think the, the thinking has, has shifted significantly. There are just two examples of randomized trials uh, on this slide um, of interventions to try and reduce the incidence of, of contrast associated AKI on the left with coronary angiography and on the right predominantly with IV contrast for, 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 C, for CT scanning. And I think importantly, the thing to note is, is the low rates of acute kidney injury, even in higher risk groups. And that change of appreciation, uh, I think is important clinically because there's also risk of not performing a diagnostic test or a vascular intervention and, and trying to uh, make sure that that balance of risk to actually much more in our favor, giving the contrast if it's clinically indicated um, is, is important. The patient perspective of AKI is also interesting because this has a number of effects on uh, that, that might influence subsequent care, um, choices around medications and, and adherence to that, and also um, uh, decisions around um, follow up and prioritization of that. And this is a slide from a few years ago now from the Think Kidneys program. But it was asking questions of the general public um, uh, to test their knowledge of, of kidney function and, and risk factors for kidney disease. And really quite surprisingly, only about half of people who were polled knew that the kidneys actually made urine. And the understanding of risk factors for kidney disease on, on the bar chart on the right was actually uh, pretty poor indeed. So there's an educational aspect around acute kidney injury and when looking after these patients that may have a big influence on um, uh, their, their patient care. As we uh, have a, a, a bit of a, a slant in this webinar today to focus on the long-term outcomes of AKI, I think um, it, discussing the epidemiology of that will hopefully lead into to Bean's talk next. But the 80% of people who survive an episode of AKI are exposed to a variety of adverse long-term consequences. And um, they include the progression or the development of chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular risk, in particular heart failure, hospital readmission, which sometimes happens very quickly after discharge, and a variety of other uh, risks have been um, uh, reporters and these probably combine uh, and affect aspects such as frailty and quality of life for, for patients. One question that's often been asked is, is how strong is the causal relationship in particular between AKI and CKD and I think to summarize a, a large body of evidence now I think that is pretty strong. And in addition to that, there's some nice examples of studies such as this one, in which AKI episodes during follow-up of large cohort studies allow a very clear demonstration of the effect of AKI and proteinuria as another marker of kidney damage, and very convincingly show that episodes of AKI increase uh, proteinuria. I think there's also a number of reasons of why the AKI to CKD transition is in particular, has in particular importance to, to, to focus on. And the first of that is it's pretty well described in terms of the, the complex pathophysiological mechanisms that drive that change, at least in the animal models of AKI. And that's in contrast to the association of AKI with um, some of the other more systemic um, uh, outcomes in which the biological pathways may, may be less clear. 
Further, the degree to which the kidney function recovers after an episode of AKI may be a really important driver of other outcomes. So on this slide, I'm going to show you data from the ARID study, which is a, a prospective uh, matched um, a parallel group uh, observational study in which we followed patients with AKI and a group who did not have AKI um, out to five years. And as you'd expect, shown in the kaplan mayer curve at the, the, the top of the slide, the AKI group uh, had worse survival and higher mortality rates. But importantly, that association between AKI and mortality and also between AKI and heart failure events disappeared when adjusted for EGFR and albuminuria at three months. So the degree of recovery after an episode is what drives that association, not the AKI episode per se. So just to summarize this, this opening talk then, um, we've described some features of um, the AKI syndrome, both in terms of the epidemiology, but also some important clinical uh, scenarios that, that might behave slightly differently. And just then finishing with the, the, the variety of long-term adverse outcomes that, 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 that occur after an episode of AKI, but then particularly focusing down into the importance of the AKI to CKD transition. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nick. So I, I think we'll, um, we should have a little bit of discussion um, about this. And I think, first of all, you know, thank you for such a, uh, it was a brilliant overview of both the clinical problem, but also some er, some other insights into, you know, first of all, the complications and also some of the introducing into beans for some of the transla translational mechanisms. So thank you for such a such a great overview of the topic. Um, I guess I, you know, I was struck again, it, it's it, rare on one level, super common on another level. Do you think the problem that AKI sits in so many specialties has been a hindrance to research, or I mean, it's a self-fulfilling question, but but it seems surprising to see it across oncology, cardiology, general medicine, sepsis, and yet it seems to me that only nephrologists and to some extent critical care doctors are interested in this topic, and which I find pretty odd. Um, what are your thoughts on interactions with other specialties, funders, labs, um, etc.? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Paddy, and, and I think as sort of nephrologists and, and critical care sort of specialists, one of our sort of roles is that sort of leadership, both sort of on the clinical side, but also in, in sort of driving research. Um, it is uh, harder clearly to, to sort of um, uh, plan research when, when, when the cases are distributed, but it's not, not impossible. Um, and certainly, um, with some organization linking to sort of electronic screening reports, remote recruitment, that type of thing. They're the types of approaches that allow you to sort of get around that. And I think by doing that and getting out into these other areas, that, that's the sort of the start of trying to engage the other specialties and, and sort of garner that, that, that interest. And I think the other thing that sort of often hinders the sort of interest in it is, is the lack of lack of interventions at the moment. There's a so what question really. And I think it's our duty to try and sort of show what can be done by sort of doing the basic things well, but also fly the flag a little bit in terms of the opportunities that are coming uh, down the pipeline from research, uh, new therapeutics and options from, from re repurposing drugs maybe. So there's lots there and, and it's trying to sort of increase the awareness of that. Yeah, I mean, obviously we could come back to this, but I was wondering, you know, we talked but interventions, first of all, I guess it's difficult to deliver interventions and presumably uh, there are a variety of interventions that have not worked. I mean, classically or may have worked and then probably haven't worked. You know, things like N-acetylcysteine for contrast nephropathy or alkalization for contrast nephropathy. And I guess uh, what's the current state of interventions to prevent AKI? Um, it, yes, I mean, I think we'll sort of get on to that maybe a, a little bit okay. later in, in the in in the webinar but I think we probably don't have a lot of time to sort of discuss um lots of different individual trials so I think there are some uh new therapeutics that are, have sort of come through to phase two and phase three so recombinant alkaline phosphatase is one that's that's just the, the phase three trial unfortunately 
stopped early due to fertility on the mortality signal, but there was a secondary endpoint that suggested possible kidney benefit. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of pharma companies who now have pipelines uh, with new therapeutics for AKI. And then the question is, is also arises from some of the new CKD uh, treatments that we've seen, in particular the SGLT2 inhibitors, which I'm sure we'll mention again as the new sort of wonder drugs for CKD, but evidence to suggest there might be value in thinking about repurposing those for secondary prevention in AKI.